As many. The chair recognized the honorable member for Marco City. Marco City, you recognize. Mr. Speaker, I rise on behalf of the good people of the Marco City constituency. And I continue to count it an honor to speak in this place on their behalf. Speaker, I, I recall my first contribution in this house in 2012. And I started with the words that I feel the weight of this place upon me and that I was surprised by that. And so it remains so today, some two years later. You know, Mr. Speaker, I look around this place and I know the audiences at home cannot see this, but in this place you see all of these photos of all of these ancient people who have sat in this place. And some look like us and some don't, and there's some of everyone and most of us. But when I see these photos, Mr. Speaker, I, I honestly don't see them. I see the person I've just passed on Bay Street trying to catch a bus. I see the constituents that I, whose doors I knocked on between 2010 and 2012 and heard their cries. I see the people who have been out of school for the last seven years and have never had a job and tell me about it. <clears throat> And so there's something about this place that I think takes you or should take you beyond yourself in your contributions. And so, Mr. Speaker, I rise to make my contribution in respect of the budget and the debate on the budget. And as I do so, I, I must confess that I have somewhat of a heavy heart in respect of it. It grieves me. Um, in certain respects. Let me start with, with a very positive aspect. I, I am so impressed, Mr. Speaker, with the effort that has been made to contain expenditure, <coughs> with the efficiencies that have been identified, um, with a budget that comes in for the first time in so long, with a deficit that is significantly lower than what we've seen in this House for, for the better part of a decade. I am so impressed with that. I'm impressed with the work that has obviously gone into the budget. I'm impressed with the wrestling that, that has obviously happened. But while I, I feel all of that, I also feel the history of this moment, because I remember where we came from. To speak, I read into the hand side of this house um, some time before, some words of Sir Lyndon when he was speaking on taxation. And for those who have this great book, Pending the Life and Times of the First Prime Minister of the Bahamas by Michael Creighton, I think it's important to revisit those words. Because he was speaking before the United Nations Decolonization Committee in October 1964. You know, life is full of ironies and circles. That happens to be the month and the year when I was born. And he was addressing the United Nations Decolonization Committee on the plight of the people in the Bahamas. And at that time, of course, we had the Bay Street Boys, the oligarchy, controlling the destiny of our people. And speaking in respect of the laws that they put in place, he said this in respect of taxation. He was speaking in respect of the indirect form of taxation that existed in the Bahamas at that time. And the way in which the United Bahamian Party, the UBP, presented that as being something to be credited, a lack of income tax. And he said the only people who benefited from the lack of an income tax were the minority who made enough income to be taxed. He said, the ordinary people suffered cruelly. 
Government revenue came very largely from import duties in an economy that imported nearly everything. This contributed to an extremely high cost of living which pressed hardest upon the ordinary consumer. It was the ordinary people, in fact, who through indirect taxation provided the bulk of government revenue. That was 1964. And 50 years later, Mr. Speaker, we're still there. We move from 1964 to 1967 and into 1973 with independence, and we, we came to a necessary, expedient, correct compromise at that time, which was that although we understood the egregious wrong in the form of taxation that we had in place, although we understood that it was wrong to fund a country on indirect taxes, meaning consumption tax, on what you eat, what you drink, what you wear, what you use. Although we understood that that was fundamentally inequitable, we nonetheless understood that we were a young country and that it was incumbent upon us to continue that sacrifice for the greater good with a view to assuaging any concerns in the international investment community that we would go in a negative direction which would impact business and investment by imposing income tax at that time. That was a compromise. It was a necessary, reasonable, very expedient compromise. And the whole premise behind it was that it would not always remain so. That there would come a time when we would do what was right for the majority by saying to the majority who happen to be the most poor people amongst us that we would no longer run the government on your back. Those who are more benefited, those who are more privileged would at some point be called upon to carry their share. And again, from independence to now, 41 years later, we have not done that. What we have done is that every government of this country bears responsibility for the national debt that we carry. There's no doubt in my mind, I think the record would, would bear this out, that the previous administration, in five years, almost doubled our national debt. They went on a reckless spending spree. There's no doubt about that. But we were still on that path. All that happened was that they accelerated the road that we were walking on. So we got to the point of crisis more quickly than we otherwise would have. They would say they did it because they were stimulating the economy in a time of great recession. And we would say we would have understood that if the money that you poured into the, if you, the money you borrowed and spent stayed in the country. We would have said, yes, we understand that. That's stimulating an economy. And we all would bear the burden because we all would have experienced the benefit. But no, the money went out to a foreign firm, and to add insult to injury, they redirected a lot of roads, closed down a lot of businesses, people suffered terribly, and they left us a massive bill, another hundred million dollars that we had to pay. All right, that's the political reality of how we got here sooner than we would otherwise have gotten here. But the reality is that we've run deficits since we became independent. And to the average person, what that means is we spent more than we earned. And the bill at some point would have had to be paid. And so here we are again. Where the only question is whether we would be a reckless government to continue spending and not caring how it affected the future, or whether we would be a responsible government and put an end to that as soon as possible and start to pay the piper. Start to raise the revenue we need and start to pay down the debt, or at least pay down the interest and have money left, some, some money left over to not overly increase the debt. That was the first question, and we made the right decision on that question. We said we will not keep going down this reckless road. We would be fiscally responsible. And I keep commending the Honorable Member for Golden Isle and the Right Honorable Member for Centerville, they have shown incredible discipline, fiscal discipline, incredible fiscal discipline.
but that was just the first part of the question. The second part of the question was then, now that we want to be fiscal, fiscally disciplined, and now that we know that means we need to raise money, whom will we raise it on? Whom will we get it from? That was the second part of the question. And that's the question we're still dealing with today. And I tell you, Mr. Speaker, when I say that I'm grieved by it, is a question with the greatest respect that we are answering wrong. Because the answer we're giving is we will tax the same people that we have been taxing for the last 41 years. The same people Sir Lyndon spoke about in 1964 and said it was unfair. The same people that the UBP taxed because they were defenseless to resist that tax. And I fear this, Mr. Speaker. And I, I, I am my mother's child. I can just be me. I fear this, that we are, we have benefited so much, the people sitting in this house, this honorable house, from the reforms that the PLP put in place, from the social and political reforms, that we are not truly representative of the people we represent. We do not feel the same pain. And this is what I experience every day. I say to people, look at the guy coming to you to wash your car. Look at the guy saying, I do not have a job to feed my family tonight. He does not crave respect from his wife or his woman or his children any less than we do. He wants as much as we want to be able to take money home and take care of his needs. Look at the woman who is working all these jobs, and, and I've, had, I've had constituents, I never forget this one, Mr. Speaker, and this is emotional for me. I've, I've had a constituent say to me, I have had to do things I am ashamed of to feed my children. A woman. We know what that means. Yep. And so the question is, when we sit in this place, in this moment in time, and we are now for the first time as an independent country taking on the question of how do we reform our fiscal house and come to the conclusion that we do business as usual and tax the poor, the working class, and the middle class, how can that possibly be right? That is my dilemma. And that is what I keep saying is a PLP dilemma. Because our answer should be different than that. I keep saying that it is not something that we should speak to, we should repeat in support of our desire to impose VAT or VAT, that it originated under this other party. That is not, a, that is not an endorsement of it. That is something that should make us stop and wonder whether it's right. That is something that should make us stop in our tracks and say, hold on. How is it that we have different political philosophies and we're coming to the same conclusion? How is it that our bases are different and we keep coming to these same conclusions? Every political entity, every country in the world with a real democratic system of governance eventually resolves into just two parties. The party of the business class and the party of the average Joe, the Republican and the Democrat, the Tory and the Labour. It's the same thing everywhere you go. And it's important to uh, democracy uh, that that is so. Because if you leave, and I've said this before, if you leave a party like us in place, and I don't say this with any fear of being in a position one of these days where these words are used against me, I think democracy is more important than the people who occupy positions in these houses, in this house. And so I say this, if you leave a party like, like ours in place for too long, we'll become extremely socialist. We'll become very welfare oriented. We will do all that we can to, to dry every tear from every eye. And in doing so, we will go beyond the line sometimes. And if you leave that party in place, they'll become so business minded and so cold hearted and so Republican and so bottom line, the market forces will cure everything, that they will become a party of extreme capitalism. And so democracy gives the people two choices. And the people move between the two choices. 
and get the best out of both. And that's how the country flourishes. But if we come to the same conclusion, then who's representing the unrepresented? This is the fear I have. This is the fear I have. Who is taking care of those who cannot do this? For us to say to the country, and this is, this is what got me moving from my comfortable position as an attorney, the president of the Chamber of Commerce, and eventually coming and begging to be allowed into politics, was in, when Hubert Ingram passed, or the former member for North Abaco, the first 2009 budget, which was a travesty, and followed it up with the 2010 budget, which was an insult. And I said, how can we allow this to continue? People need to go forward and show a different path. And our answer to that seems to be, oh, because we are in this terrible place, let us add insult to that injury by putting another tax on the same people on top of the tax he put there. And then we say, no, no, but we're going to make it a little better. We were going to let you carry two loads, but now you only have to carry one. We're going to tax you 15%, now we're going to do seven and a half. That's like coming to someone's house and saying, listen, I was going to steal both of your lamps, but I'm only going to take one. A nice guy. It doesn't help. You're still taking one. You got one left. And what is egregious about it is that it is not the only choice that we have. It is not the only choice we have. I'll say something else about Sir Lyndon. It's in the same book, and I'm just going to put this down after this, but I, he wasn't a perfect man, and none of us are, but I constantly go to him because He gives a lot of clarity. And he said in his final speech in this house, I'm trying to find it, yeah. He said in his final speech in this house in 1997, he went over his whole life and he used these words which I find telling. He said, I know only too well that there's more to be done. I know only too well that there's more to be done. And what are you speaking about? He's speaking about how far the PLP brought this country. The political revolution that we fought to make sure we had the right to vote. The social revolution that we then went through to make sure it wasn't just on paper, but was in reality that we and everyone in this country could aspire to the same things. He's speaking to the last revolution, the economic revolution. And he says there's more to be done. I know we left some stuff undone. And interestingly, that takes me to a totally different quote. I've just been wrestling so much with so many things, Mr. Speaker. And it took me back, of all things, to his bend or break speech in Grand Bahama, 26 July 1969. And the words that most people remember are these. Bahamians are nevertheless, he spoke about all the glory of, of the city of Freeport and how it was for others and not not for us. And he says, Bahamians are nevertheless still the victims of an unbending social order, which, if it now refuses to bend, must be broken. And the thought that comes to my mind is you can easily substitute in that economic for social. And it speaks today. Bahamians are nonetheless the victims of an unbending economic order, which, if it, is not, if it, is, if it now refuses to bend, must be broken. Because we are not. We cannot escape the fact that we're talking about putting the, a greater burden on the same people. So I say once again, taxes are really only of two kinds. You really only have two choices. We can get into all the esoterics of taxes. We could have some really um, sublime debates on, on what falls in the gray area between the two, but ultimately it comes down to this. You can tax people directly meaning straight on what they earn as their profits in their corporation and in their income and so on, even in their capital gains and their estates and so on. Or you could tax them the way we do, indirectly. Just build it into the price. 
And the inequity with that is that though, when you build the tax into the price, there's no proportionality in how the tax affects me or the other person. If I make a million dollars and I want to buy a bottle of milk, I pay the same tax as the guy who makes $100. And so the tax doesn't have as great an effect on me as it does with the guy who makes $100. And therefore it is not proportional, and therefore it is not equitable, and therefore it is not fair. And so, once again, we come to this question, not whether we're going to tax. We got our, each other in this mess. We all got ourselves in this mess over successes, successive governments, and now we have to get out. And so we've had a lot of people say things to us about the tax that we should have. Reference has been made to the Compass Lexicon Report. Reference has been made to the IMF Report. Been made to reports by the Chamber and by its committees and so on. And the one common factor between all of them, especially when you look at the IMF, is that we start the debate by saying, we do not want income tax. What else is the fairest tax around? And we come to the conclusion that the tax that is fairest is VAT. But that's the same as loading the deck when you start to play the game. You cannot take it off the table and then say the conclusions you reach justify it not being on the table. You took it off the table. You can't do that. That, that just doesn't, that doesn't prove the point. For instance, when you look at the Coalition for Responsible Taxation, and you say, we're going to now um, consider their report and Compass Lexicon and all the rest of these as being authoritative. You have to look behind that and see how you set that up. The Coalition for Responsible Taxation emanated out of the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce represents the businesses, not the people on the street. And therefore, the Coalition itself starts off with the premise that we don't want to be taxed. How do we go about um, agreeing to a tax which does not affect our base. And so again, you load the deck. And you're surprised that you come to the conclusion, and everyone comes to the same conclusion, that you should go down the road of that. The point I'm making is very simple. You cannot start off by excluding the people who will be the objects of this tax from the debate, and I'm not talking about a town meeting. I'm talking about a separate approach to considering, putting everything on the table and saying, who do we tax? Not loading the deck and saying, let's take this off. Let me give you an example. This makes the point a little more clear. You go to New Zealand, for instance, because their name comes up quite a bit. Their name comes up quite a bit. This is New Zealand. New Zealand has, let's use their 2011-2012 revenue. And this is the latest one that's available to the public that I've found. $55 billion that they raise annually. Yes, they have a GST, which is substantially equivalent to our VAT. And they raise $14.6 billion from that. But that, together with all other indirect taxes, meaning taxes that you build into the price, only account for 36% of their revenue. 63% of their revenue is direct taxes. 63% of their revenue is either corporate tax or individual income tax or other direct taxes. 63%. Two-thirds. Every three dollars they make, two-thirds come from direct taxes, targeted to the people who have money. Only one-third comes from this indirect mechanism. And so when you take the, go to them, you ask them the question, is that a good thing? Yeah. Why? In the context of a properly broad tax base. Because they don't have a system which is dependent on indirect taxes. Two-thirds of their taxes are direct. And then they make the statement, and this is published um, by the Inland Revenue Office um, for the Minister of Revenue in 2013 it was published. New Zealand's tax system is robust and provides reliable sources of revenue to fund government programs. Our tax system is perceived as being among the most coherent in the OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. The different pieces of the tax system fit together well, and the tax bases are broad. Different pieces. 
the direct tax, the indirect tax, all fit together well. You don't just take a piece out and then say, because this piece serves you within the context of your entire tax revenue base, that you could tell us that this piece would serve us as the main source of our tax revenue base, or as one component of that main source. And I, 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 I rephrase that just now because the last um, clarification we've gotten on this is that there will be very few exemptions on VAT and that there will not necessarily, need, necessarily be any substantive um, rolling back of customs duty. And so the, the, broad, the, broad, the broad summary of that is that this just becomes one more component of an indirect tax system. And remember where I've started, Mr. Speaker. I agree we need to raise money. I agree that we've all contributed to this deficit. I agree the FNM ran it up and ran it up like they were drunken sailors very quickly over a short period of time. But we all have to pay it. And the question is not do we have to pay it. We could have done the same thing they did and ran up another billion dollars and we would have gotten it, we would have borrowed it. And then somewhere down the road, five, ten years, fifteen years, they get the government back and it's their problem. But we've taken the responsible approach. We say we're going to deal with it. We're going to deal with it. We're going to raise some money. We're going to see that we don't run these ma massive def deficits. We're going to pay our interest and start paying down our debt. The question is who are we going to get it from? And I'm trying to do this this way so that we could see what the real distinction is. This isn't a VAT, no, non-VAT thing, you know. This is a question of who pays it. You can get rid of customs duty and put in VAT, and that's just another indirect tax. And it's equitable because everyone should carry their proportion. But to leave both in place and then still leave the richest people out of the game cannot be right. Any alternative? Yeah. 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 Our decision, and I'm just I'm just laying this out in a very methodical way. Because clearly we're going to have this debate all over again when we bring the fat legislation to be considered. Um, and I'm trying to make it very clear. This should not be either emotive or sterile. People's lives will be affected by this. And I repeat what I said before. This is the first time in the history of an independent Bahamas that our parliament has, the, has had the courage to say let's look again at how we raise revenue and let's put a break let's put a break on deficit spending and growth of the, of the national debt. It's a very responsible thing we're doing and I'm saying that last component we're leaving out which is are we taxing the right people? Just that component how do we go to our constituents and say that when we had to make a decision between taxing ourselves and taxing you, we chose to tax you? How do we make that, that argument? Because, because demographically, that's exactly what's happening. Demographically, that's what's happening. This is an indirect tax that will affect the poor disproportionately. This is an indirect tax that will affect the poor. Once you do business, you will pay back. And I will say it one more time, just so the public does not miss it. For me to spend, for the government to come to me and say, Greg, give me $100, does not hurt me in the same way as going to my receptionist and saying, give me $100. They're not paying proportionately. Matter. Hey, Mr. Speaker, wow. The member stands on the point of order. It is only important for to me recognize the member for my Mr. Speaker, I think the member might, might be saying it as I understand it, and I want him to clarify if I misunderstood him. I understood him to say that the poor will be paying, and those who can afford it will not be paying. Now, I never said that. No, no, fine. If you didn't say they will not pay, then I would withdraw that. But my understanding was if, I, if you went to your constituents 
you will be uh, having a difficulty saying, you will pay, but we will not be paying. That's what you said, in fact. Now, I think what you may want to say is that the proportionate or the proportionality might be an issue for the mathematician, but everybody will pay that. And I haven't heard you say that. I won't be saying that. Well, that's what it is, though. Thank you. Thank everybody you. will pay VAT. Thank you, I'm, I'm happy to, to have Member that, for Marco City. That, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to have that interposition because it, it clarifies again the issue that we're having. Member for Marco I City. Have a point of order. Mark, there's no point of order. You have the floor, Member for Marco so City. Let me, let me just keep going. And I'm glad we're having some discussion. Discussions are healthy. And my point is very, only this, and I will say this again. When we are talking about indirect taxes, they affect us all the same if we buy the same item, use the same goods, or do anything that that, that indirect tax is built in. And that in and of itself is inequitable. That's why indirect taxes are called regressive taxes. That's why direct taxes are called progressive taxes because one is equitable and the other is not. And that, I think, is actually the ultimate. I think, and let me just repeat what I just heard. You need to do a combination of both. I'm glad we're going there. This is really a learning exercise, and I agree with that. And to the extent we already have the indirect tax in place, to the extent that we already have the indirect tax in place, and it's been in place for the last umpteen years, including 41 years of independence, now bring the component, which has never been in place for 41 years, the direct tax. Because otherwise, people who make more money, like us, will not feel this tax in the same way as people who make less money, like the average constituent. And that has to be an effort. You know, Mr. Speaker, I, I fear sometimes that, that we are missing one very basic point, that the average guy on the street is not missing, that it does not benefit the country to replace the Bay Street boys with the Sunshine boys. It doesn't benefit the country to take rich white people and replace them with rich black people. What benefits the country is to create opportunities, which was what the PLP has always been about. Education, housing, lending, everything. That's always been the, the, the drive of the PLP. Always. Always. But to drive people further into, attack, into poverty is not the, the role of our, our party as I see it. Mr. Speaker, there's one other part of, indir of di direct taxation. I'll leave that one. I've spoken on that enough. But I want to mention a few other components that we are going to lose the opportunity to have with direct taxation. One of them is that we will lose the opportunity to deal with corruption. We will lose the opportunity to deal with business corruption, political corruption, all forms of corruption. Because the good thing about direct taxes is people have to make, make reports. And this wouldn't apply to most of the country. If you, if you took a simple measure, very, very simple math, you say that for the first $50,000 that people earn, they will not pay any, any income tax. You will exclude 90-something percent of our country. It will not touch them. And if you say the average guy who's doing really well is making $75,000, the first 50 is out, the other 25 he pays 20% on, meaning he's paying 5,000 out of 75. If he makes 75000 he takes 70000 home, but he pays 5000 For most people, it would never touch them. For some people, it would touch them marginally. For the very rich, it will touch them significantly, and they would be then paying their fair share. But more importantly, for those in our system who are corrupt, you will get to see them make a return every year on where their money comes from, and when those returns are untrue, you will get to see them march into jail. I always remember Al Capone, the gangster in the U.S. They could never catch him. They could never catch him on being a gangster. And so they passed a law on tax evasion. 
And their position was very simple. I don't care what the source of your income is, declare it and pay taxes on it. And if you don't declare it, once we find it, we don't have to prove where you got that money from. We just prove that you never declared it. And you go off to jail. And that is one of the essential, um, one of the, the, the very great benefits of a direct taxation system. You don't have, you lose the benefit of being able to give incentives to businesses because there's no direct taxes for the government to give, give incentives on. You cannot say, listen, we're going to roll back this tax or give um, preferential treatment for those who bill here and there on these taxes because they're, they're just not there. That is a crucial tool for government so that you do not have these other agreements happening in the background which are less than transparent. You have statutory provisions which are put in place which apply to the entire population if they fall within the range, and you're able to stimulate business. But we lose the opportunity to do that. And so the question is, is what is the alternative? The alternative, of course, is to impose a direct tax. To impose a direct tax on the people who've had a tax break for 41 years of independence. The alternative is having imposed that direct tax and having a totally new source of revenue, you can then reduce customs duty. You can then reduce something like a tax on gas, which affects everyone and terribly inflates the economy. That's one of those taxes that gets cycled through every system of production in the country. If you are getting goods delivered to you, if you're running your generator, if you're running your electricity, everyone pays that repeatedly. It's one of the most inequitable kind of indirect taxes. But it's a significant part of, of our system of taxation. Another, we keep one here alternatives, we can finally get to the point as a PLP philosophy government of increasing the minimum wage. That has to be done. If, and again, it's all built on the foundations. If we would finally tax the people who have money who would be given a 41 year tax break to, we will finally have a broader base of income in our country. We will finally be at the point where we're able to reduce customs duties. We will finally be at the point where we're able to increase the minimum wage. How can, how can it be right for someone to take home $150 a week? <coughs> I mean, the minimum wage, in some people's mind, might be a statement to the public that this is the minimum you should pay someone. What it's become is a statement to the public that this is the maximum that you're required to pay someone. No. And so the minimum wage becomes the wage for most people working in menial jobs. And it's a statutorily sanctioned wage. Once again, it was passed under these guys. You would think, you would think philosophically, under the other party, you would think philosophically that we would have a problem with that. But you would think philosophically we have a problem with that, but we don't. I'd like to see some things happen on taxation. And I'll just state a couple of those because I want to move on to talking about Grand Bahama a little bit. I'd like to see the, cent the greater centralization of government purchasing with, if we're serious about corruption, with oversight by whoever happens to be the opposition of the day. Seriously, it's a very simple formula, you know. If we are in power and we're buying stuff, why shouldn't the other people be able to look at it and have oversight over it? Not to make decisions but just to look at everything. And if they're in power, why shouldn't we be able to look? That would deal with corruption so quickly on such, on such an easy level. It's not much different than in the states with the General Accounting Office, you know, Congressional Budget Office and so on. It's not very different. You cannot spend and also oversee your spending. That's not a check and balance. Someone has to spend and someone has to be able to look to see if the spending is being done in an appropriate manner. It would change things significantly. And, it, and that is important, the fiscal um, responsibility, because it deals with what accountants like to politely call leakages. It deals with overpricing. It deals with corruption. And we're at that point again in our country. We're at that moment in our history 
where we have to make a decision where we're going and where we're not going. And you know what is always interesting, Mr. Speaker? And you see this historically throughout the world. The public tends to be ahead of the politicians on these issues. And, and we sometimes convince ourselves that, that they don't get these issues. They may not be able to articulate it in these ways, but they get the point. And this is something that our country desperately needs. I am just say it. Again, on fiscal discipline, fiscal reform, I would love to see us finally enact the Proper Freedom of Information Act. Again, not the one that was enacted by the opposition party and not commenced. It was enacted, it was just not commenced. Not the one that was enacted but not commenced. It's garbage. It, it, the loopholes, just get rid of it and pass a proper one. It is, the, it is a terrible piece of legislation. I mean, it's, it's not even, it's a travesty was ever passed. One of the exemptions for giving information when it's requested is that it will cause stress to the person you're releasing it in respect of. It's stress. How could that be an exa a, 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 a reason to exclude? Did so-and-so steal some money? Well, I can't tell you because it will cause him some stress. It is garbage. It's absolute garbage. And, and we should never commence that. We should do a proper one because that was just absolute nonsense that they passed. Mr. Speaker, I have said this before and I'll say this again. We really need to enact our version of the English Administration of Justice Act, 1970 to 73, to solve this housing problem in our country. And let me just say it in very simple terms. <coughs> we are having conversations with the very people who are trying to take the houses away from persons who have fallen on hard times. And we're saying to them, can we agree on a formula to address this? I mean, that's one approach. It probably is not going to work. It hasn't worked in the past because you wonder what the motivation is for the person who can take the house to say, okay, I will tie my hands and not take it. The approach that's been used throughout the world, and I only point to the English statute because, you know, we borrow a lot of statutes from England, um, and it's, they're more in line with our legal way of thinking. But the approach that's been used in other parts of the world is simply to say, we will give a discretion to judges. No negotiating with banks, no anything. For instance, when we, when we enacted Unfair Contract Terms Act, this parliament made a decision that certain terms, if you put in a contract, are simply unfair, and they will not apply. It's a very similar kind of legislation. And it has the benefit of being legislation that's been passed in England since the 70s, that has myriad of judicial examinations on it, and we know how the legislation performs. You give a discretion to a judge simply to say, in the event that anyone with a mortgage wants to sell a house, one, you need the permission of court to sell it. That's not the law now. The bank can sell your house if they want to once you default. It's only if you, leave, if you refuse to leave your house that you need the court to give an order for possession. But once a bank gets you out, or if they insert a clause saying that you're a tenant, anyway, I don't want to get into legalese, but the bottom line is that right now, no bank needs permission of the court to sell anyone's house. They need permission of the court to give possession and complete the sale, but not to sell. And so the English approach is to first say, no sales of homes, dwelling homes. This has nothing to do with businesses or your rental apartment or anything. The home you live in, the homestead, the thing that is your biggest saving that you want to pass on to your next generation. No court, no one is allowed to do it unless the court says you can. And then the legislation goes on to say, when you go to the court, the court has a lot of, of discretions it can exercise. Typically, what happens is that if you have a very short, if you have a mortgage that you've only had for a short time, a 20-year mortgage you've only had for two or three years, the court is going to let it be sold. Because it's, it's just too much life left in the mortgage to try and protect you under. But where you have, and this is happening throughout this country, you have people who've had mortgages for 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 years. They're down their first, their last two or three years to pay. They fall on hard times and the bank sells the house that they have been building and looking forward to passing on to their children or 
selling for their retirement all their life. And the bank just sells it. You give the judge a discretion and the judge says, well, we can capitalize the interest, meaning all the arrears of interest you have, we'll just add it into mortgage and make the mortgage some bigger. You can extend the mortgage period. You only have three years left to pay, we'll give you eight years left to pay. You can change interest rates, you can do all sorts of things. And it doesn't cost this parliament or this government a penny. It's just a discretion. And that's where that discretion belongs. That's the way it should be. Not with us, but with the courts. Because they have a whole body of law that they administer a whole body of authorities to tell them what rules to follow in exercising that discretion. And the convenient part of that is that we don't get into these Article 27 questions about deprivation of property and so on. It's a judgment of the court. It's a simple, simple formula. And it applies throughout the world. These predatory practices that international banks have in small countries like the Bahamas should be stopped. You need to do it then. And I say just pass legislation that gives a discretion. This would be finished. That's right over there. Just a few short comments on Grand Bahama, Mr. Speaker. And then I'm going to I'm going to stop. A few short comments on Grand Bahama. The 4th of August of this year, 2014, is coincidentally the anniversary of two very different experiences in the history of this country. One, it's the anniversary of the, the 59th anniversary of the signing of the Hawksbury Creek Agreement. And two, it's the anniversary of Emancipation Day from 1834. <laughs> on the same day, and I, that's a bit of irony that's interesting. It's a bit of irony that's very interesting. Emancipation Day is the first Monday in every month, and it happens to fall on the 4th of August this year. And it, it reads, it begs this question. What should be our relationship going forward with the, with the Port Authority? Again, I've never, had, I've never been subtle in these views. I have very strong views on this. Let me start by saying this. In 1973, we like to say the Bahamas became independent. We would be more accurate in saying the Bahamas, except the port area where the city of Freeport is located, became independent. That would be a more accurate statement. Because in 1973, we did not take sovereignty over the city of Freeport. The city of Freeport is still run by a quasi-governmental entity called the Port Authority, which has two very distinct roles. Very distinct roles. One is a quasi-government entity, which means it, it exercises power that we delegated to it. There are Supreme Court judgments that say this. We delegated the power. That's all it is. Delegated prerogative power that they're exercising when they're acting as a licensee. Just like when we give power to local government councils and so on. We delegated some power to them in 1955. <clears throat> and their second role is that they're a business. They, they compete with their own licensees, they run business enterprise in the city of Freeport, um, they own land, hold tracts of it. They're a business. As a business, we can't do anything with the Port Authority any more than we could do anything with any other business. They have the right to their property and they have the right to their contracts and they have the right to their business. But it's a very different consideration when it comes to them exercising our power. And this parliament has actually considered this before. This parliament considered this before in 1970, right after Sir Lyndon's Bend or Break speech. And we enacted something called the Immigration Special Provisions Act, I think it was called, where we took away the prerogative power we'd given to them to decide all immigration matters in the city of Freeport. No amendment to the Hawksburg Creek Agreement, nothing. We just took it away. We didn't rationalize it. It took decades for the Supreme Court to come along. Justice Gad Patsing, sitting in the Supreme Court in Freeport later in the Court of Appeal here in Nassau, showed us a rationalization that it was a prerogative power. No government can give away its prerogative powers. And in fact, even what the UBP purported to do in 1955, did not survive, could not have survived the 1968 Constitution, or the 1973 Constitution, because both those constitutions vest this parliament, the parliament of which we are a part, with the responsibility for um, law, order, and good governance of the country. Peace, order, and good governance. Thank you.
All of us, all parliaments have that. And if this parliament sits down today and delegates an authority to a certain minister, this parliament can revoke that authority. Any delegated um, prerogative power can be revoked. And as I say, we have done it before. When I say we, I speak collectively of everyone who's ever stood in this place. This House has done it before. This Parliament has done it before. We have revoked from the Port Authority the prerogative to immigration before. Why that's very important is because when you look at the Hawkesbury Creek Agreement, there were seven sources of revenue under the Hawkesbury Creek Agreement. Seven. They had power, electricity, one, telephone, cable, water, I can't do my finger like that, garbage, license fees, service charges. They sold everything that had to do with utilities. All they have left are license fees and service charges. Service charges, we have nothing to do with that. That's private contract. They own the land and they have the, con the right to collect service charges. License fees are only there because we let them license. And so the question then arises when you look at it that way. All the other roles that they played, they've sold out. Their contractual role for service charges is their contractual role. No one in the country could take it away from them according to our Constitution without compensating them. Their licensing role is ours. Why are they still there? Why is it that in the 21st century, 41 years after independence, when we talk about the city of Freeport, we're still talking through a middleman whose only role now is to collect money on license fees that we allow them to collect and who have the the dilemma that all of their sources of revenue, which were meant for them to be able to discharge their other roles in the city of Freeport, they've sold. And so we, we shouldn't be surprised that license fees have gone up astronomically in the city of Freeport. And we shouldn't be comfortable just sitting down there and watching that. What I'm obviously saying is calling for this parliament to seriously consider revoking the prerogative powers of the Port Authority under the Hawkesbury Creek Agreement. There's no reason we should allow those to remain there. I don't want to get into the utility stuff. That's contractual stuff. All I'm saying is the one area that has always been ours, and we gave it to them to utilize, and we have the right to take it back, and we know that because we've done it before, is the prerogative power for licensing. Why are we still allowing this to continue? You know, living in the city of Freeport, it's very tempting and I don't want to speak for other family islands, but it's very tempting to look to Nassau and believe the people in Nassau believe that there's such a thing as the Commonwealth of Nassau rather than the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. It's very tempting because it seems like the family islands, including Freeport, are used as profit centers to collect revenue and spend in Nassau. And every once in a while, when, when there's a, a jerk of conscience, you, you send something back. I don't know the last time we've gotten anything... Um, in Grand Bahama. Let me, let me just interject this because I don't want anyone trying to create unnecessary political tension here. I applaud the Minister for Grand Bahama for that contribution he made today. I was as motivated by his contribution as he was. I am, I am so gratified to hear the amount of work the Ministry of Grand Bahama is doing. And I mean, like they say in the old days, Godspeed, brother. I wish every success to that ministry. But why have a stumbling block around its neck in the name of the Port Authority with a licensing right? How is that helping us now? And the other way of looking at it is, are we going to leave Freeport in this position for the next 40 years? Will it be another generation in 2054 that finally gets freed of this yoke? 2054. And so I think we need, to, we need to consider. And I'm certainly calling for it. I don't think we should be shy of calling for it. I think, I think that is a question. And I've laid out some very, and I, I don't lay these things out off the top of my head. The law is there. The authorities are there. The reasoning is there. The cases are there. Is the will there? That's the only question. Is the will there? Mr. Speaker, I have some concerns about the city of Freeport, which have nothing to do with the Ministry of Grand Bahama, for Grand Bahama. As I say, it's doing a sterling job, as far as I can see. 
But there are still some really concerning things that are arising that I would, would be grateful if we could have a look at. The use of casual laborers in Freeport, and especially the use of outsourcing in Freeport is becoming a tool to deprive the average worker of, his, of all protections under the law. And that, again, is not something that we need to struggle with. That is something that other jurisdictions have struggled with, and they've learned how to deal with them. When you look at the uh, so-called unfair um, unfair dismissal laws under the Employment Act, they carry the same wording as the English law does. But they have nothing whatsoever to do with unfair dismissal as in England. They only have to do with being dismissive you're in your union, or you decide to strike or something, nothing else. But in other countries, they've looked at this issue. This is not a new issue. And they've made rules that if you have someone, you try to, to get rid of your, your liability, say you're the harbor company or the container, or something, some company that deals with, with, with I, I want to deal with industrial accidents first, some th company that deals with significant possibility of industrial accidents. The easiest thing for you to do is to say, listen, I don't want to hire you guys. I'm going to let someone incorporate a company with limited liability and no substance behind it, and I will contract with them and they will hire you. And if you are injured, sue them. Don't look to me. But laws have, can be put in place that make sure that when you deal with that, the question is who gives ultimate instructions, who has oversight, and to define employment as continuing notwithstanding the imagery you put around it when you look through it and look through the substance of the relationship. But while we sit idly and don't do it, people are exposed. People are terribly exposed. All of our severance laws, such as they are, one, only come into place after you've been in, employed for six months, and two, are only between you and your employer, not the place where you discharge your labor. And so once you have that middle man as an employer, you're exposed. Again, those are laws that were put in place by the other party. We should look at them. We should be the ones to sit down and protect our people. And though that is a ripe area for us to look at. I would just I would just stop with this, Mr. Speaker. For us to extend the tax benefits under the Hawksburg Creek Agreement, the tax exemptions in 2015, is for us to give away, one, our only negotiating card we have with the Port Authority, and the only one we'll have for however long we extend it, and two, it's for us to entrench this colonialism that exists in Freeport. I know the rest of the country may not feel this, but we in Freeport feel it. And it is not a Freeport problem, it's a Bahamian problem. Because when you look at Nassau, when you look at New Providence, the two are symbiotic, they should work together. Your problems happen to be the same things that we have capacity to solve. Your land prices are too high, we have a lot of land. Your roads are not, not sufficient, we have a pile of roads. You have too much population, we don't have enough population. It, it just makes sense to start migrating the population away. It makes sense to start building in Freeport. And I don't mean foreign direct investment. I mean stimulus from our government. We say we don't have money, but we can find $232 million for the defense force. Okay? We can allocate or project $100 million for BAMC and spend about $22 million. We can spend on games. We can do all these things. None of them are wrong. Don't get me wrong. There's, there's credit in all of those things but we can have the same view with respect to Grand Bahama and recognize that we cannot build our commonwealth without building, building the second largest city in it. And for the politicians amongst us, who are all of us, let me just make a point. No government since 1992 that failed to win Grand Bahama has ever won a national election. None. Every government that has lost Grand Bahama has lost the national election since 1992. One year, we tied it in 2002. But every other government that has lost Grand Bahama has lost the national election. We are on the right track. 
I don't want them to win. We're on the right track. All I'm trying to do is speak to the conscience of my own colleagues to say, guys, we are on the right track. We've pushed in the right direction. We've taken on a burden that other people refuse to take on. Can we make this a more perfect experiment, a more perfect solution? Can we look again, even if we do not believe or if we do not see the pain that we're going to inflict? We certainly must see that it is inequitable to give the same people the same tax break for after 41 years, including us. Mr. Speaker, these are significant times. And I said this in this house before, the problem with a, with a historical moment is you do not see it until you're past it. You do not see it while you're in the midst of it. You're just living it day in and day out. You're going home, you're eating breakfast, you're kissing the wife or rowing the wife, you're doing whatever you're doing. You're driving and traffic and, and you come and you contribute to this process. And because of, of the energy around you, things are going on, you don't see the significance. This is an historical moment we're in. And if we get this right, we get other things right. If all we do is increase taxes on the same people, we will restrain the deficit, but we will not get rid of it, and we'll continue to grow the debt. And we still have the piper to pay. I'm saying we can do a better job at that. But let me just say, I applaud what has been done. Clearly, I cannot support um, putting another tax on poor people. I just cannot support that in my own conscience. But I applaud what has been done, and I, I hope we can look at it again. Thank you, Mr.